webinar um, on politics, economics, and public policy in Nepal. I'm Avidit Acharya, and I'll be introducing the presenter and moderator for today's talk. Our speaker today is Dr. Krista Ratanapruk. Dr. Ratanapruk is a cultural and economic anthropologist who has been researching Nepal and Nepali diaspora communities in South and Southeast Asia for more than the last 15 years. She received her PhD in anthropology from Harvard University and previously taught at the University of Virginia, Rutgers University, and Chiang Mai University. Her book-length project, which she'll be discussing today, focuses on cooperation and competition within the Manangi trade diaspora. Dr. Ratanapruk is currently an IIDS senior research fellow. Now, the moderator for today's talk will be Dr. Yamuna Gale, who is also an IIDS senior research fellow working in the field of development. Dr. Gale is a food security and governance expert who has worked on behalf of the Nepal government in various capacities, most prominently as a council member of the Nepal Agricultural Research Council, as well as for the World Bank, FAO, and other international organizations. She was previously affiliated with ISIMODE in various capacities, working mainly on natural resource management, gender, and social inclusion issues. Her articles have appeared in a number of academic journals, reports, and edited volumes. Dr. Gale is a graduate of the Wageningen Agricultural University in the Netherlands, and she obtained her PhD in food security governance from the Agriculture and Forestry University in Chitwan. So now before Dr. Ratnapruk starts, uh, let me remind our participants of the ground rules. Please remember to keep your mics muted until, unless you're invited to speak. Dr. Ratnapruk will speak for about 40 minutes, then we'll have a half hour Q&A session moderated by Dr. Ghali. You may send in your questions via chat or use the raise hand feature on Zoom. As always, we thank the IIDS staff, particularly Ms. Binisha Nepal for supporting this series. Okay, uh, Dr. Ratnapruk, you may start. You're muted. Okay, hi. Namaste, good evening, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to be sharing my work. And I'm also sharing screen right now, right? But can you all see me in the picture or not? Sorry. Yes, on the side. Yes. Yeah, all right, yes. all right, great, thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my work among the IIDS colleagues as I've been mostly, mostly sharing my work among in academia, among anthropologists and historians. So really looking forward to engaging with people who have been working in the area of policy and also to be sharing the work with people outside of the discipline of anthropology and history. Um, I want to be sharing my screen further. Um, trying to move my slides. You can um, you can just press the enter button, right? Yes. All right, great. So since we're at home with people um, across um, sharing with the work with people from different disciplines, so I would like to situate the framework of my research a bit and the methodology. So as um, most of the work presented here has been by uh, economists. So I would like to put my work in relation to the work of economists and the webinar that have been um, in, the, in this series. So one, um, one difference between, I mean, we are both, both economists and anthropologists are interested in understanding human behaviors and how they make decisions. But uh, e economists um, do infer individuals value preference from people's decisions, right? And they seek to understand factors and variables that affect people's decision with respect to their utility function. Anthropologists, on the other hand, seek to understand how individuals value preference is shaped by larger social forces, such as cultural ideas, political, religious values, social norms. And these value preferences, um, the value preferences that inform people's behavior. So they're interested in the larger social forces that shape people's value preference. And uh, one fundamental difference is the premise of the 
discipline, the, the different the difference in the premise of each of the of, of the discipline of economics and anthropology is that in neoclassical economics, we treat individuals as an independent entity, while in anthropology, we take it that individuals' decisions are always shaped by larger social forces. And therefore, and sometimes individuals are not even aware of those influence, but it's that, that we are interested in understanding people's decisions and behaviors, and we are looking at trying to understand the larger forces that shape them. So despite these differences, there's some commonality between anthropology and a handful of economists, um, uh, new institutional, uh, the, the approach of in, new institutional e economics, which considers the role of cultural ideas and social institutions in shaping economic activities, um, such as in promoting economic growth, in reverting the tragedy of the common. So likewise, anthropology, I mean, the main um, interest in anthropology is to, exam to examine the cultural ideas that shape social institutions and humans, how, how, hu how individuals create social institutions and establish shared social practices and norms. And in turn, how these institutions reinforce the cultural, cultural ideas and the values of the society. So we take it that individuals exist in the context and they are the one, and these individuals create the social institutions which enforce social values, which shape individual preference, which in turn inform their decision. But then the question is who in the society create those social institutions? Who in the society create the rule of the game? So in some societies, majority of people do it. In some societies, only a few people in the society do it. So that's something, um, we also attend to. So within that framework, my research investigated the social arrangements and ideas that enable the Manangi diasporic trading community to sustain and expand their trade and to build wealth and also to use that wealth to, uh, uh, to ensure the well-being of people in the community. And this, their trade, their trade started centuries ago and they were competing, trying to uh, with larger European counterparts, the European East India Company. And in the historic, historiography of trade in Asia, uh, the established history is that once the European came into Asia, all the trading, Asian trading communities have been wiped out. But a small body of literature has emerged that that's not true. A small number of trading communities have continued to trade until now, they have thrived even after the arrival of the European. So why did some communities thrive and some did not? So that's uh, a, a, a number of scholars, of historians have been looking into that. And along that line, uh, my work investigates the role of internal social, social institution in the Manangi community. So why am I interested in the Manangi community? Because as you, many of you are aware, they rose from one of the poorest to one of the wealthiest communities in Nepal. What is remarkable about that community is that they rose collectively as a society, not just a few individuals, but as a community, most people in the community became uh, well off. Um, and, and another thing that is fascinating about the Manangi community that may be less well known among people in Nepal is that the uh, despite the community size, which is about 6,000, 7,000 people, there are multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious community that is geographically dispersed across South and Southeast Asia. And, um, and they married women, they married local people, they, they marry local women in the societies in which they trade and become Muslims and the uh, community is dispersed and diverse ethnically, linguistically. And another third point that makes the Manangi in interesting, which echoes with uh, what I mentioned earlier is that the thrive, how these small trading communities thrive is, um, is not something to be taken lightly because compared with the European traders who came to Asia and established trading post empire, 
the European travel with armies and they were backed up by their government and they set up trading post empires and they had a large capital to buy up all the commodities and become price, um, they set up price in the market and became, they monopolized the long distance trade. These um, traders, these small Asian traders had neither capital nor political or, or nor their own government nor the army to back up their long distance trade. So what did they do is a very intriguing question about that enabled their trade to survive. So my research question specifically would be looking at how have the Manangis create um, created internal social institutions across the vast geographical space to achieve collective goals, not just the economic goal of creating wealth, but also broader goals, fulfilling their ambitious social um, social goals and also spirit, spiritual aspiration, which I will talk later on. But um, the specific question is, what does it take to maintain a community that is geographically dispersed, but internally connected, yet develop intense social relations with outsiders as they travel and trade. Also, how do community members recognize others who are not simultaneously present in one location, who sometimes do not even share the same religion and ethnicity? Aside from that, how do they learn about other social and moral characters, their financial credibility, as they form relationships, social economic relationship with them? So the contractual relationship. Um, so these are some of the questions that I would like to explore in my work, I, that I did explore in my work, but uh, a little bit on the methodology. So what's the method in anthropology? It's ethnographic research because if we are trying, we don't infer people's value preferences, but we try to understand the forces that shape their value preferences. So we try to understand their thoughts, their subjective experiences, and the larger, larger social forces that shape their, exper their subjective experiences, their thoughts, and therefore their social actions. So how do we understand other people's subjective experiences? We do that by being in the same context and in the same environment as those people we're trying to study. So that's why the method called participant observation. You participate and you observe. So mostly um, how I collect my so-called data is that I engage in casual conversation. Um, not a lot of them are formal interviews, mostly in for casual conversation, spending time together and trying to, uh, trying to understand their world and trying to understand how different, what are the, um, thoughts and forces that shape their thoughts and their behaviors. How these, how the, how various, um, what are their concerns and what are, how did they come to have those concerns, right? So let's take a look into their world. I'll show you a glimpse into their world. Uh, the research <laughs> spread out over five years. I take it, I take you along this trip for five to seven minutes, maybe. So, um, past and current trade route, past trade route, overland into Tibet, into India, also over into Burma, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore on foot. And also they travel, um, they rode on British ship, um, getting on in Calcutta, going to Madras, going to Rangoon, Penang, Singapore. They travel disguised as British subjects carrying Indian passport obtained obtain in um, Kalimpong. So anyhow, um, um, so they travel both overland and, and over the uh, and maritime. And then uh, once um, over time they started flying and travel the recent trade routes were Nepal to India Flying the uh, the red are the red are the, the air routes Bangkok um, still to Burma but on the border from entering from Thailand Malaysia Singapore they have also gone into Indonesia Hong Kong as well as you may have heard about the gold trade from Hong Kong so uh, they trade in on various items their trade routes change over time the things they trade it change over time. Um, so a few things I will look, uh, 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 a large fraction are gem traders, 
uh, buying gems in India, Burma, Thailand, selling in Malaysia, Singapore, traded in handicrafts, in silver, in um, um, various items. So, so we'll go to, we travel along their trade routes, we go to rooming houses at their trading sites. So wherever they travel, they meet up, the Manangis meet up at their various trading sites to share communal local residences. And um, the first picture that you see are communal rooming houses, a communal rooming house, which Manangi, Manangish traders share. And um, they also trade side by side. They go buy together and they go sell together. They travel together. So the bottom picture is at a gem trading town in Thailand. And they're buying uh, ruby, sapphires, emerald, all those precious gems selling, buying together, they share knowledge, they give feedback on each other's assessment of the goods. And for that at the trading sites and in the rooming houses, these are places where they can pool knowledge, share resources, offer mutual assistance. And they also, one person discover new trade routes and new sources of gems they share with others, then the rest of them among the rest of the Manangi community follows. So that's how trade routes change also. So it's like what uh, the kind of knowledge of trade in the community is a collection of knowledge, a composite of everyone's contribution. And um, so what is, what are some, what is it like in the rooming houses? So high level of trust. You may see in the first top picture, you see a bag, Inside that bag are lots of expensive gems, um, precious gems. And the lower picture also, you see a trader with a duffel bag. He's spreading out his gems that's in the rooming house, examining what he bought and what he's going to sell at what price. And when they go to, out to trade during the day to sell to jewelry shops, they don't take all of their things. They take only relevant ones and the rest are kept in the duffel bags and the duffel bags are never locked. And there's always someone in the rooming house. So that reflects the level of trust in the community. And also um, the, in the top picture, you see a lady, they have a sophisticated system of rent sharing and space sharing with respect to external constraints, such as uh, duration of tourist visa, the nature of the market. For example, in Singapore, uh, precious gems at jewelry shops and Orchard Road, they stay maybe one week, so this lady, Manangi lady, they came, she came from Manang. She runs a rooming house. She runs a house from a landlord in Singapore. She pays monthly rent and then she collects rent from these dai. And on the floor of a rooming house, a big, a big room, lots of mattresses line up in rows. And so that's one bed, one hotel room, one hotel bed. So how, uh, she collects money per night so instead of staying at hotel rooms, the Manangis can stay in these houses, in these houses and they, share, they can share their knowledge, they can share their information, they help each other, they look after each other's gems and um, the lady cooks and serves food. And then on a different site, for example, in Malaysia, um, they stay for two months at a time. It's a market for less semi-precious gemstone as you see in the bottom picture. Um, so for that kind of gems, they stay for two months at a time and they set up a so-called a shop, a pasal. So you see that room in the bottom picture is a former Chinese coffee shop. Inside that shop, they have 30 tables. One table is one pasal and one man stays for two months at a time selling the gems that he bought in, in um, India, Thailand, Burma. And, um, he finished selling and then he goes home for two months and he goes home and he buys and he come back in two months. So the rooming house in Malaysia is shared, the rent is shared differently. So a house like on the top left, a mattress is shared by two people, two partners. One partner stays for two months and, and that man also takes up the table downstairs, I mean, in the lower picture. And for the two months that he's gone, the other traders come for two months and take over the mattress and the shop. And um, then the rent is split up, monthly rent divided by 30 tables or 
30 mattresses and each mattress divided by two people. So a very sophisticated system of rent sharing, sharing space. And these systems, these are just one example. There's so many different arrangements. It's adjusted and changed and revised over time. During SARS epidemics, it's different. So, um, so how did that, those rooming houses and these Chinese coffee shop that became uh, 30 pasal, how this, and there are more than 30, they're like three, four Chinese coffee shops. How are they set up? Manangi men's marriage with local women is significant to the development of the Manangi communities abroad. So on the left picture is a picture of a Manangi man, a man, his name is Nima. He used to travel and trade in gems and he would travel and go back to Kathmandu. Eventually he married a Muslim, a Muslim, Malay Muslim and became Muslim himself and adopted the name of Ali. And he has a daughter named Farah who's standing next to him. And um, she was the one who helped um, set up this uh, renting a room. He, they brainstormed, they have an idea and Ali helped rent Chinese coffee shops. So Manangis no longer had to sell on the sidewalk and being harassed by police, they can sell inside the, the coffee shop. They also, instead of staying in hotels, they start to rent a house of their own and share the rents. And so these cross-cultural marriages and families serve as points of connection between local and translocal society, economy, and culture. On the right picture is Farah and Mukya. Mukya is a Manangi man who used to, he, he, he used to be itinerant trader, trading in gems as well. He married Farah. So often the mixed children continue to marry within the Manangi community. So maintaining the social ties in the Manangi community that did not assimilate to become Malay or Thai or Chinese, but they maintain a mixed identity and as well remaining member of the Manangi diaspora, diaspora community. So what do they do with, what do the Manangis do with uh, when they meet outsiders, people outside of their community, they turn external social relations into internal social ties. And, um, and, and um, so their community is expansive, but their, what binds them together is the mutual reciprocity that counteracts the fragmentation of their community. So um, foreigners become Manangi, Manangi Buari, and but they also participate in the norms, in the rule of the games, in the Manangi community. So, so, and it's not only just in the economic realm that Manangi, um, that the diaspora communities are involved in connecting uh, dis disparate economies with the, from in the local trading sites with the translocal one, but um, religious ideas and um, religious aspirations and goals also travel through the trading sites and through the Manangi diaspora community. For example, when the Manangis wanted to build a stupa in Lumbini, uh, his, uh, Manangi, uh, Manangi has their own stupa aside from the Nepali one. Um, uh, you'd see uh, architectural drawing of the stupa with the, num the amount of gold needed and the amount of money needed. And this uh, architectural drawing was circulated in the diaspora community and I was asked to carry it to Ali and he would share it among the Manangis um, living, traveling through Malaysia, through KL and um, soliciting do donation and people have obligation to contribute and their contribution is recognized publicly. Um, they're given uh, gold or silver or plain color kata scarf and they are offered receipts and those are engraved on the stupa later on about who donated how much. So, so even though he'd become Muslim, he, um, there's, a, there's still a sense of connection. The community, what is, what is, what is um, striking about the Manangi community is that there's acceptance of differences, religion, ethnicity, as long as they share the, the same cultural logic of uh, mutual cooperation. But this cultural logic of mutual, mutual cooperation is not just a simple equation. And I would like to walk you through in the rest of this talk to understand 
in a way, what this equation looks like. Um, so we'll be moving on. But um, participation is unequal, but every contribution is valued and acknowledged. And um, people contribute according to their capacity and according to their ability. But it's a particip participation that counts. So, so moving on from the trading sites abroad, coming home, what do the Manamis do when they come home to Nepal? And um, they're hardly at home. Um, they are, when I go to meet, when I went to meet them, they were either at a gompa or at a picnic. So from morning to evening, sometimes overnight at the gompa, gone two, three weeks at a time, or otherwise they've gone for a picnic all day long. So I will look here, now we turn to look at what frugality abroad, as you see in the rudimentary, rudimentary nature of their rooming house, what frugality abroad enables them to do at home, which is what I see as conspicuous consumption and fulfilling spiritual aspiration at home. So what I mean by this, that's a gompa built by money from trade. They pull money to build the gompa. They participate in three week long religious retreats almost every other month. So about four or five retreats per year, large amount of donation uh, collected to support the events. So it's also a community of monks and nuns. These are family members of the traders or some of them are former traders. So there's enough surplus from, from trade to support a large fraction of population in the monastery. And um, so here, um, so three weeks long uh, religious retreat, uh, what do they do? Participate in austere religious practices between trading trips. They pray, they chant, they count beads, they prostrate um, about two, three weeks at a time. And let me, give one example. Uh, the famous Nyungne fasting retreat, they eat and drink only after 36 hours for three weeks. They do this for three weeks. And you see trading men and wives. And what do they do? They have a sophisticated system for hosting the rituals and uh, contribution of labor and money as a host. Um, the fasting retreat, people sign up 12 years in advance, six members per year who want to host the event and a specific amount of money so, uh, collected from each couple. And they contribute labor, serving food, um, taking care of all logistics, serving tea, arranging everything. Also, uh, other people, um, aside the, from the six couples, other people also made addi make additional donations, supporting meals, supporting for tea, but there's also precise information and public knowledge about who donated how much. So at the end of the day, the monk who leads the chant, at the end of the day, he announces, this is Garma Tenzing from Singapore. He makes a donation of 30,000 rupee to support the meal um, that we ate today. And the merit goes to his, mo his mother, Do Dolma, and his father, Garma, uh, who lives in the Ngao village. So this is precise information about location of individuals, their financial credibility, their level of generosity, their moral character. And also, they're, and also they add up money. They also add up the number of beads counted so as they uh, chant, they also count beads. At the end of the day, the host, he's doing the calculator. That's adding up the donation, but also adding up uh, two lakh, three lakh, five lakh uh, be number of beads are counted. And at the end of the retreat, it's announced as the achievement of the community. So it's a collective, um, collective, they treat it as a collective achievement and contributed by everyone uh, oh, yeah. on equal oh, ability. And then that's, that's adding up the. the <sighs> So similarly, um, people do this all the time, not just some, for example, six couples, one year, six couples sponsor 300 Manangis to participate in a three week long fasting retreat in Bodhagya. Bodhagya. And a large, they are, the Manangis are proud of the 
large participation by many people and they're treated as a collective achievement of the community that local 300 people could participate and that six, six couples sponsor it. So, I mean, all these uh, religious activities is something that they aspire, they make merits, uh, good deeds, rebirth, reincarnation. It's, these are individual goals, but they pursue it together collectively. They could be chanting at home and fasting at home, but they don't do that. They do it together and they're drawn from each other's support. And they could be building their own um, stupa, but no, they want to pull money and build one large stupa. So aside from large elaborate religious re retreats, they, they also build religious monuments, new monasteries. These are in Swayambu. They, they also, so part of the equation is that individual goal, but achieve collectively, meaning they do it together as a collective endeavor. So they line up individual goal with collective goal. And in that collective endeavor, not everyone participates equally. They don't have the equal mean to participate, but people participate and contribute according to their ability. Uh, then ownership belongs to everyone equally. So, and we will see this cultural logic in other domains as well. So moving on, so we see religious projects in the village, building, renovating Gomba, building, building prayer wall. All these are monies from trade. Sorry, so aside from uh, what, what do they do with the money from trade, with the time that they're not trading, participating in religious activities, in retreats, also social gatherings. Uh, social gatherings, what they call picnic, in the picnic, they pool money to organize a picnic, uh, meaning they eat and drink, they cook, they gamble, uh, and then they pool money to run a picnic. But then that money before, well, it, once a year, they use that money for hosting the picnic. During the course of one year, the money is deposited among different people who will take it to use, invest, and then bring back with interest. So in a way it's a credit rotation. And um, so there are maybe 10, 12 different kinds of picnic of different sizes, um, different circles of people, men picnic, women picnic, uh, relatives picnic, clan picnic, different levels of social units. And so I will take a look at just one, um, the, one of the largest picnics is the gambling festival, archery festival. All Manang, um, so there are seven villages in Manang Valley that become a social organization of the Manangi in Kathmandu, even though they don't live in a village. But each village organize a picnic, and they have a archery fest. They have this archery festival as a consent as a they have a census within each village. All the married men will eventually will have to take turns hosting this picnic. It's a contribution of labor. You organize everything. They use the village fund to organize. So what do they do? Uh, gambling of various kinds. Price money, 50% of it goes to village fund. And then um, about, sorry, the, sharing of the price money. So for example, um, so card games, 15% go to the village fund. Archery, um, two teams, one team, each, per, each person put in the same amount of money. And when they win or they lose, they distribute this, the price money. And they take risk, unequal ability, they share the consequence. But one thing is that is, um, that say something is the symbolic ce ce celebration of the, um, of the winner. Uh, so when someone lands uh, the arrow at the, at the target, then um, instead of sharing with the money with people in the team, he gets to keep it all. But to counter that, he actually shares with the rest of the village, with the, everyone who buy drinks, and give it to everyone. So instead of sharing with the team, he gets to keep all. Instead of keeping all, he shared with everyone. So that's a big celebration to indicate who the winner is and who made the donation, who made, who, who shared widely. 
So what do people do with the village fund? They invest in public goods, roads, school, ambulance, free health clinic, all people's home. So how are the decisions made? Uh, who manage the village fund? Six members of a village committee. All men are have to serve on the village committee rotation among households. And um, of, among these six couples, uh, six men, the chair is selected. And it's not elected, but it's chosen like among six people, draw lottery. Who get? So there's an emphasis on no rivalry, no competition. Everyone is equally good. You're willing to serve, then you pick a lottery. So attempt to avoid conflicts and rivalry. And so what to do with the village fund? So at the end of each archery gambling festival, the village uh, accountant, they have an accounting sheet uh, distributed, given to everyone. A high professional accountant will describe uh, what happened in the year, how much village fund there is, how much is it deposited with whom, and how is it returned, how much is it returned with interest and, and used for various social and religious projects. So that gambling festival is just one, but there are, as I mentioned, there's so many different picnics. So intense religious life, intense social life, many picnic groups, obligation to host, obligation to participate, both the gambling festival and the picnic, they take attendance. If you don't participate, you get fined. And so in a way I take participation in these picnics and in the archery festival as a kind of tax, uh, collecting tax. The more money you have, the more you have to gamble and you more, the more you have to participate. Uh, lottery, they sell lottery, lottery tickets, households with land with house have to buy a, a certain amount of the lottery tickets. People who rent a house have to buy a smaller number. So um, it's proportional um, to the wealth. And it's enforced not just this rule, but people know also whether someone is participating according to their ability. So as we see these picnic groups in a way, it's, it, it involves different circles different levels of intimacy, different sizes of capitals being circulated. And of course, different levels of knowledge about different individuals are different degree of knowledge are circulated in each circle. So what I wanna say that what I, the, what I showed, what I described, it's just a snapshot in time. The, how the Manangis organize their fasting retreat or their gambling festival, it's not always like this, it changes over time and so for example, in the past, um, they, were, they were not using cash. The organizing the fasting retreat, the hosts were not contributing cash. They contributed farmland. Some people contributed labor to farm the land and that would be the grains that they use during the retreat. Now it's cash contribution, same as the gambling festival. The specific arrangements were completely different, but the idea, the idea is still the same, the idea of pooling resources of um, fulfilling individual's goals collectively, religious goals, reinforcing uh, the values that they deem important to their community, whether the idea of redistribution, generosity, and all everything. So, so when I wanna isolate a little, what's the cultural logic of the Manangis, the collective effort to achieve shared goal and the shared goal is desirable to each individual. And we see this cultural logic also in Manang when they were, um, as a pastoral economy, they cooperate to make irrigational canal and to use, to graze animals without um, leading it to a tragedy of the common. In trade, they pool capital, they create collective saving, they rotate their funds. In religion, they, fast collectively, they build temple collectively, and for social purposes, they create they um, create public goods collectively. So this is a con collective goal of the community. It's just one area that uh, they didn't adapt very well was national politics. As I had mentioned, they were not so fond of election and um, election really tore the community apart and the Manangis were saying, let's not do collect 
let's not make international election. Let's just take turns running. And let's just take turn running and winning and save the money that you use for campaign. So, so there are different areas, but we see cooperation in multiple, in various domains of their life. But despite the conflicts, uh, conflicts definitely arise, their bloody murder, their killing, everything. But despite the conflicts, they also, we continue to see cooperation. The earthquake destroyed their gompa, the center of their religious and social activities. They raised fund, oh, I don't remember the amount, huge amount of money, and we built the gompa again. And so that's the plan for building the gompa. They continue to uh, provide public goods, um, provide social services, not only within the Manangi community, but outside of the community as well. They have eye cam, dental, dental cam. They um, uh, earthquake. Listen, um, outside of the Manangi community, the Manangi uh, got together and helped contribute towards the earthquake relief and flood relief. And their effort um, to help went beyond the Manangi community. So I want to come back. Uh, I mean, now we let's say goodbye to the Manangi community and we look at key aspects of the Manangi society. So one is that there's an uh, individuals fulfill their goals and their aspiration through collective effort. Yeah. So they were successful at identifying shared goals, whether it was trade, re their religious ex aspiration or social well-being of indi individuals. They have majority of people participating in identifying those goals and creating institutions to meet those goals. So you see how they different systems for running rooming houses, different systems of hosting Ningne fasting retreat while in the village is one thing, while in Kathmandu Valley is one thing. So they keep changing, they keep adapting, they keep finding new, uh, new social arrangements. So it's very, uh, their social institutions are very adaptive because there are, more, there are many people participating, therefore there are more solutions available to them. It's also a community of high tax, uh, a lot of social obligation, a lot of pressure to contribute according to each person's capacity, whether not just cash, pooling resources, knowledge at trading site, donation at religious festivals, many social obligations, um, obligation to participate in gambling festival, obligation um, at a family picnic, for example, the more, the more wealth people have, the more you need to contribute to the picnic fund. But the different ability is widely acknowledged, publicly acknowledged, and people acknowledge unequal contribution. And those uh, unequal contributions are appreciated, but they be, um, toward, uh, but unequal contribution, but towards a collective, and that collective is shared is accessible by all individuals in the community. So high emphasis on, re on redistribution, either of knowledge and skills in trade, in gem trade, pooling capital, redistributing capital, collective, collective saving, credit rotation, equal sharing of responsibility, contribution, contribution of labor, like a, a con there's a census, you have the community census, all men, all married men are, their turns will come to organize a gambling festival. And um, for hosting picnics, also taking turns. And communal sponsoring of religious gatherings are accessible to everyone. So high emphasis on redistribution, high emphasis on making resources shared and accessible by others. And also high degree of information flow within the community information about individuals, as you see, a donation at trade uh, at the religious festival, financial credibility, moral character. As people who are host come to serve at the festival, their kins also come. So when you go to a religious festival and uh, Mr. A is a host this year, and so you see his whole kinship network and friends mapped out in front of your eyes by the people who circulate, serving tea, serving water, and serving meals. So 
There's also um, financial transparency, accountability, they hire professional accountant um, to take charge of village fund, community fund, and uh, the material goals are embedded in non-material goals, meaning you see that ideas about how to run an economy, uh, religion, um, kinship, you see all these actions are interconnected and intertwined. You make the donation in, for the religious ritual. Is that an economic action? It's, is it an economic decision? Is it a religious decision? Is it a kinship decision? Um, this year, uh, my uncle is a host. It's all intertwined. And so this shows that development of social institutions must come from within a society according to its specific cultural and historical context, according to the values specific to each society. So I would say that um, it's, um, it is possible, but it is challenging to adopt or import institutional arrangements from one society to another. It's possible, but it's not always successful. Uh, but perhaps maybe it's a little bit easier is that perhaps uh, aside from institutional importing, adopting institutional arrangements, a, one society can also be inspired by the values or the goals of other societies. So it's a question of can one society adopt another society's value preference and goals? Cultural ideas and value preferences are normative. They are not empirically proven. They cannot be empirically proven. They cannot be arrived at logically, analytically. It's a normative set of value. So um, can, can we in, be inspired? Can one society be inspired by another society's value? So the role of anthropology in policy discourse or in the society is that it puts a mirror on a society to reflect on the value of our society. Right? What's the value in our society? Uh, sometimes we're not aware completely. And um, so also within a nation, we have diverse communities of diverse sizes, of diverse scales, different sets of value preferences. So now moving on, um, so a challenge to IIDS that I'd like to put forward, can we develop a language or a set of vocabulary or a methodology for recognizing the strength of a community's internal institutions in enhancing or reducing the well-being of its members? So for example, we think of three examples. The first one, the Manang society where strong societal norms create conditions that allow all members to thrive or create norms and conditions that um, give incentive for members to collaborate. It's not that they're inherently more collaborative. It's not that they're inherently more helpful, more generous, but they create social institutions that try to elicit those characteristics of individuals. And they try to do that. And then they have a shared goal of what they wanna do with that. So, and so let's consider um, a conservative Muslim village. We talk about um, internal, the, the strength of an internal institution. A strict Muslim village, okay, have a strong societal norms, could be punitive to some, but uh, now it's a question of who create those norms. Does it ensure the well-being of all members of the community equally? So um, strict and punitive institution doesn't mean strong institution. We're talking about strong institution that enhances and, and enhances or reduces well-being of its member. Or, or, or we consider the third example, a village is displaced by a national park or, hydro pro, or a hydropower project. Temporarily rich, but the society is torn apart and what goes with that society is the kind of internal institutions that are developed within the community also. So I would really appreciate a conversation and engagement with people who have been working in the realm of policy as that is the area probably anthropologists are most far removed from anthropology than anyone else <laughs> of all academic, economic, ac academic discipline, but we don't have to be that way. But I'd like to take this chance to learn from those of you who have been working in the realm of policy and 
um, what can we take out of it? What can we learn from this Monangi community? Can we develop a language, a way of talking or recognizing uh, the strength of a community? Um, can we can we talk about the multiple aspects like this and think that um, community that are strong, that have strong institution have these characteristics? Can we put these to test? And what are other things that may go in here? Uh, maybe we have to look at other communities also. And or do we come up with an index similar to uh, literacy rate, infant mortality, other uh, other index that indicates um, the well um, the well being of a community. But in this way, an index that indicate um, the strength of the internal institution of a community in enabling, motivating, shaping people's behaviors and enable enable them to improve the well being of majority of people in the community. So these are questions that I would really appreciate um, discussion hearing from you all. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. So, Brook, for this uh, wonderful presentation. The yeah. topic itself was very, very uniquely interesting for me also. And I think uh, it's also so for other participants. The topic itself, capital production, capital accumulation, and the cultural ideology. It's a very interesting topic. And now I would like to go for uh, some of the questions that has already been uh, put into chat. So I will go one by one first, and uh, uh, Dr. Ratnapruka will uh, respond on it first. And then if time remains, then we can also take additional questions. There was a first question from Puspa uh, uh, Raj Karnikarji. Uh, our question was about the size of trade and how it is growing. What is the size of trade? Okay. And uh, how it is growing. Okay. So I don't have the exact number, but we can see it from the, from the infer it from the size of the religious festivals, religious retreats, the size of the religious monuments. I don't have the numbers, okay? The size of the religious monuments. And how is it growing? Well, a large part, as I mentioned, is through the circulation of capital, through collective saving, and redistribution, redistribution of capital of, of surplus in their community and then use it for social and religious projects, reinforcing a lot of various values that are important for um, their community that um, in trade, in all other areas. So it's a two, you have two communities, one of capital production, the international trade and capital accumulation through religious and social institutions. And then again, capital production through trade. So that's the re, they reinforce one another and that's how it is growing. The size of trade, as I mentioned, so no exact number, yeah. Okay, that's great. And the second uh, set of questions from uh, Alok Bohra, uh, there are uh, four set of questions. The first question is about success and failure rates yeah, uh, thank of you. these enterprises. That's yeah. the first question. Yeah. Can I can I go through four set of questions? He has. Sure, please. So first is the uh, success and failure rate of the enterprises. This is first. The second yes. is how the skill transfer from generation to generation, especially on Jame trade. Yeah. Uh, so skill transfer from generation to generation, how it's been going. Uh, it's about human capital formation aspect. The third question is about how they have been managing the financial capital. Was there a traditional banking system or community lending or what was the borrowing system? So that's the third question. And the fourth question is in USA, youth and educated people are living from the family, living from the community. But what is the incidence in Manangi community? Is also a kind of trend in this community or not? So those are the four questions, please. So the last one, is it by Bubanji, despite their no, no, social look. setup? No, I didn't see the fourth question. Sorry. Fourth question is uh, fourth question. about- Is it in chat? Uh, yes, in the chat. Uh, fourth question is in USA, when uh, people are educated and these youth people wanted to move out of community. 
Yeah. So is this the same uh, incidence in Manangi or not? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank you for all the questions. I'll go one by one. Uh, the rate of failure uh, and success. Again, I don't have numbers, but many fail, many succeed, many fail and become monks, many fail and move on Yeah, to do other things. Um, switch from one kind of trade to another. But what it, we see here is that, say for example, gem trade, right? Um, that's linked with the third question about how do they manage their financial capital needs? So as we see financial capital needs, so Manangis, majority of them above the age of 40 have not gone to school. Many are lit illiterate, they cannot read and write. They do all this trade without writing down. And so, of course, they wouldn't go to the bank to take out loan. So that's why um, we have, that's why I talk about the, how capitals are pooled in their community and how they rota rota rotate it by being deposited with different community members. So that's their lending and borrowing system and various different kinds. And that's precisely the, 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 the essence of of my work also, that's to show that this is the mechanism that enable them to pull surplus from trade abroad and pull it collectively through different religious and social institutions and then redistribute it again when banking was not an option. And um, so you can see from this, so like if a gem trader failed, got robbed, um, made a bad move, lost money, of course, there's um, of course there's an obligation to return the money, but the house will not get confiscated. There's a broad network to uh, support, slowly pay back the loan, help from community members, and those people who pool the money for the picnic will not take away his house, for example. So that's uh, what I mean about uh, for the community to take risks together and to share risks. Uh, informally. So there's failure, people also become monks. There is success and people have moved from gem trade to invest in informal economy, hotel, carpet factory, airlines, travel agencies, um, import export company, distillery. So success as well. And I don't take success, uh, I don't take these economic activities as only indicator of their success, but look at the degree of their religious work. It's something they consider important, the extent to which they can um, uh, put together a religious practice that enable many people to participate, um, religious monuments. I mean, instead of numbers, I look at these artifacts, cultural artifacts, and that's the evidence, yeah. Uh, rate, so, sorry, not exact number, but yes, there is. I can say the degree, the both end, the extreme end of success and failure. And uh, transfer, yes, skills from generation to generation. Yes, so traveling together, trading together from one person to another, from generation to, an eight, to generation, traveling and trading together. So they were talking about most people, most traders, professional gem traders go to gem, gem school. They learn to trade in gem, gemmatology. But Manangis are, they, Manangis are quite proud that none of them went to those schools and yet they could develop that pool of knowledge among themselves. Um, and then the fourth question about the Manangis, yes. So this is a community uh, that I studied during 2000 to 2005. So since then, yes, many have um, shifted to participate in, 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 for, in the formal economy, invest in, in the informal economy. They have become doctors, biologists, engineers, bankers, work for UN, um, doctors. They have also migrated to the US taking US visa, work abroad as bartenders, as um, work at gas station. There is a diaspora in the US. They send money home. During the earthquake uh, relief, they send money 
back to Manang, um, to the Manangi community in Kathmandu, and instead of the head monks reading who lives that who lives where and who contribute money, how much, for what purpose, it's Facebook. Mr. Something in New York in Queens made um, $2,000 for the building of the Gompa, $3,000 for the uh, restoration of uh, houses in this and this village. So it's a change. There's always a change in the community. Dynamic, always changing. What I present was a snapshot and to say that that's not a static picture, snapshot during a period of time. And my, my research was a historical question. How at a particular point in time, the Manangi rose um, and changed, the community changed like that. But it doesn't mean that these social institutions will stay like this. It doesn't mean that right now they're doing uh, the fashion retreat like but this way, they may not, they may have changed, they may have adapted. And they now they also take money from the bank. Yeah, thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, there is an interesting question from Bhuvan Bajrachari ji. Uh, in your presentation, you said that uh, despite of the cross-cultural marriages, uh, back home, Manangi diaspora have same strong bondage with the community and contribute generously. What other Nepali communities can learn from them for similar generous contribution for the larger community they belong? So this is a very interesting yes. question. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is questions for all of us to think about. And I think it's a question that I raise also at the end of the talk about, it has to do with what each society value. And about value, it's not about, it's, there's, um, it's about what a community values. <laughs> and for what purposes, for what goals, what do we want as a community? What does a society want? What do individuals in the society want? And how are their goals compatible? Can they work together to achieve those goals? And uh, as I mentioned that we can learn about the institutional arrangements of other society. We can learn about how the values in each society and maybe be inspired. Yeah, thank you. Or, Others want to respond to this question? Other people in the audience wanted to respond to this question? Maybe first we take all the questions uh, relevant to your presentation first, and then if there is a time permits, then maybe others can also contribute into uh, just to make a fair justice to all the participants who have put questions. So there is a question from Susan Arielzi. Uh, he wrote that, how is it that such institutional practices crucial to the creation and maintenance of the trade networks. Yeah. So we're unable to leave press yeah. written records. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Very interesting question. Because they don't write down the records about their trade. First of all, they don't write. Um, people who write in their community are monks and they write religious scripts. They write um, chants and prayers and um, they may write about Buddhist, Buddha's teaching. They don't record trade. They don't write things down. They are not used to using pen and paper. And um, so that's why it's very interesting because many communities have written records like receipts and orders, um, all the papers involved in long distance trade. It's very unusual about the Manangi communities. Also the British, or the European themselves also did not write much about them because as I mentioned, Manangis travel disguised as British subject, traveling with Indian passports. So we, I went to look in the British, arch, British library, the archive, um, no mentioning about the Manangis, but they were talking about um, Indian traders, these traders and the, the activities, the trade routes and everything very similar. I could recognize that this is a Manangi trader, but there's no man mentioning, there's no such category as Manangi trader. And so, and so that's why um, we rely on oral history. We rely on actually ethnography because there's a diaspora community. That's a living institution. You don't have to look at papers. You don't have to look at records because that's a living, it's a living institution that have continued until now. The rooming house, how they trade. That's why we I enter 
through ethnography, looking at contemporary institutions and arrangements, trace back, um, supplement with oral history, and also other people who wrote treatises about their trade. Monks who travel wrote they encounter Manangi traders in the 1820s. This monk encounter Manangi trader from this route. This is written in monk's biography. <laughs> Monk's biography, I travel from here to here and I can encounter Manangi traders along the way. So no written record. Yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have uh, four minutes to uh, more. Uh, uh, there are uh, very good uh, compliments uh, from Deva Sarmaji, Ramesh Kandelji, Alok uh, Boraji. But there are two questions. One is from Ram, Ram Acharyaji, how you defined Manangi group? Uh, the, it, is, it is by historical factor, or it's because of the policy induced factor, or it's because of the religious uh, bondage or the religious uh, belief they have. So this is one question you have. The other question uh, from Hom Pantaji, any comment on the potential of Manangi institution to promote capitalistic, <laughs> capitalistic development beyond subsistence? So okay. these are the two questions you have, and the rest is the compliment you have for the okay. nice presentation. Thank you. So first question. Um, not, so perhaps, um, so definitely the identity of the Manangi, what defines a community? What defines a community? Definitely not geography because disperse, right? Uh, members in the diaspora, yes. Yes, members in the diaspora would include Manangi Buari, foreign Buari. So therefore not religion, not ethnicity, right? And not religion, we have Ali, we have Muslim Buari. So what defines is the cultural logic, the shared cultural logic. What I talk about, the relationship between individuals and collective, how they meet their individual goals through collective endeavors and how they share the, how they view ownership and access of those collective goods by individuals, individuals access to those collective goods. Goods not in a sense of material things only, but um, knowledge, religious merit, right? So uh, they seem to me more Buddhist who take good behavior towards community very seriously, right? Potential of Manangi institution to promote capitalistic development beyond subsistence. Yeah, I thought I have, I thought what we have seen is really beyond subsistence because they don't worry about food to put in their mouth. They worry more about rebirth. They worry more about next life. They more worry more about um, um, uh, achieving uh, Nirvana, they worry more about, I mean, in the end, um, wealth is secondary. Primary ultimate goal is religious aspiration. You talk to the Manangis. Yes, wealth is a goal. Material well-being is a goal, but there's a goal beyond that. So that's not the ultimate, the last goal. Wealth alone doesn't do them anything. They don't want to go to grave with just money. They want to go to the grave with more than that. Um, um, their own virtue, their religious merit, merit that they have accumulated during this life. So I would say that this is beyond than putting food in their mouth. This is beyond putting, meeting their material needs. This is about meeting their spiritual goal this is about meeting their social goals, all the social concerns that they have and how they, the, all the public goods they create. I think that's also beyond subsistence. So, and I think this is their institution. This is their capitalistic institution. That's how I see it. Good. Thank you so much. I think uh, given the uh, time limit, now I would like to uh, close the discussion here. And I first would like to thank uh, Dr. Ratanaprabh for this very interesting presentation. 
I also would like to thank IIGS management for giving me this opportunity to moderate this very interesting discussion. And I appreciate all the participants for putting very interesting and uh, insightful questions uh, for interactions. Now I request Advidji for your closing remarks and uh, close the session, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yamanaji. Um, I don't have much to say for the closing remarks, except to say thank you to Dr. Ratma Pruk for such a fascinating uh, uh, and thorough presentation of, uh, uh, of her study of a very specific community, Nepali community. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. And I also wanted to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ghale Yamanaji for moderating uh, the discussion. And I look forward to seeing everybody next time, next month. Thank you. Good. Thank you, everyone. So before we part and disperse, oh, is, uh, is there anyone who would like to take up the question on, uh, on the realm of policy and how do we develop language oh, okay. or vocabulary methodology for recognizing strength of the community, community's internal institution, strength of community's internal institution? Any thoughts? This is a part that I was looking forward to hearing from those who have been involved in policy. Can I, can I share my two bits? Yes, please. Uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and I learned quite a bit. Uh, I think what the, the thing that you're looking for is what we call the social capital and yes. economic. And I think this uh, social capital concept that these communities uh, engaged in has been very successful in uh, promoting not only the uh, human capital as well as financial capital. I think this uh, this is a great example of that. So I would, uh, uh, you know, suggest that I, I'm sure you must have done quite a bit of study uh, uh, in the course of this uh, research. But I think institutional economics is coming along slowly to complement uh, the neoclassical type research that you know we do uh, regularly. Yes. So I think yes. A very good example of how a, a society can create its own right. so-called market. Right. So I think got a very good. Uh, so I would encourage you to further uh, get into it. Uh, do some institutional economics. Look yes. at some capital formation strategies and so on. I think it's a yes. wonderful. Application. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone for two more minutes? <laughs> oh, okay. So this is Hom Pandu from Australia. Please. Uh, hello, hello, uh, Dr. Pandu. You, you mentioned that the, um, the, the goal of Manang is is very spiritual. Yes. So what they have been doing is to to achieve their spiritual goal. So uh, there may be other communities whose uh, uh, cultural and other institutions uh, may be designed to achieve similar sort of but different goals. Yes. So we can we can study various communities and find out how their uh, institutions are contributing towards their goal. Yes. What may happen is that all these communities, what they have got there, are not comparable to one another. They are very different. Yes. So we can have one set of cross-section that might shed some light, but it will be difficult to really provide that sort of comparison and define a language um, or, or, or set of rules um, extracting from all of these. That's the sort of um, impression I got. But anyway, your presentation was quite interesting. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, so I'm trying to understand uh, the last bit of what you had meant, what you said. Um, so you're saying yeah, so, that there are yeah, other so. communities that, sh that 
Sorry, would you mind rephrasing it? Oh, right. Okay. So um, it it may not give us any um, any idea to develop a, a sort of a universal language across communities. Yes. Because they are all different. Yes. Yes. Uh, potentially different. Okay. So uh, we yes. can say that they are all different, but potentially different. Yes. And also, uh, <clears throat> Uh, like like you said, the Manangis are now um, studying and you know going overseas, right. establishing themselves there. Yes. So uh, these these people, uh, in next generations and generation after generation, when right. they start actually going to school and learning how to write, how to document, and all sorts yes. of things. Yes. Yes. Do you think that their current institutions would still survive? No continue it will change they will change yes. they will keep changing how they yeah. organize the new Year fasting retreat how they organize a gambling festival they, it will change definitely it will keep changing as they have always been changing and how they access credit rotation and all those those will also change yes okay so yes so there will right. be, uh, that's what I would say, that there will be a difficulty even in establishing a language. Yes. Or Manangis. Yes. From their institutions to their goal. Because the goal is shifting. And so the institutions are. Yes. The goals are shifting. The goals may be shifting. As long as they identify the goals <laughs> together. Yes. And as long as the main thing is that the cultural logic that they will identify the goals together, uh, much, many people participating in identifying the goals and finding collective way to reach those goals um, who, and aligning individual goals with collective goals. Those are the cultural logics. Would that cultural logic change or not? That I also don't know, but yeah. if anything, I think that will be longer lasting than institutions. Uh, like that will be longer lasting than the specific ways in which they organize the gambling festival, the specific ways in which they organize the fasting retreat, the specific ways in which they pool money uh, through picnic credit rotation. Those specific ways may change, but the cultural logic of collaboration and contribution according to ability, capacity, and equal contribution, meeting individual needs through collective endeavor, endeavor and shared common goals. Uh, those are cultural logics that will last longer than the specificity of the institution, but those cultural logic can also change over time. Yes, yes. Will that, yeah. will that survive? That's the question. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Ready. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.